Here's a fun question. What three-digit number is the weirdest? It seems like a trick question, and it is, but if you said 836, congratulations. You see, in number theory, there's a concept known as a weird number. The smallest one is 70, and the next few are 836, 4030, and so on. But what's so weird about these numbers? And more importantly, what's the motivation? What makes them so important that they hold the universally prestigious sequence title of simply weird? In this video, we'll answer these questions and show how it ultimately relates to the mathematical quest for perfection. But first, we need to start from the beginning. Number theory is the branch of mathematics that focuses on integers. Instead of using numbers as a means to an end, we examine them in detail and get to know their unique personalities. By the way, throughout this video, I'll be using the word number to mean positive integer. The first thing to know about a number is whether it's prime. Other than 1, which is considered its own thing, every number is prime or composite. With a composite number, you can divide it by one of its factors, aka divisors, to break it into smaller pieces. But a prime number doesn't have any factors other than 1 or itself, neither of which really break it up. So all you can do is repeatedly divide by 1. In this sense, composites are composed of other numbers and primes are indivisible. But there's a lot of internal variation within these categories. For example, consider 34 and 36. Neither one is prime, but in my opinion, 34 feels a lot more prime than 36. The reason for this has to do with the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. It tells us that each composite number has a unique prime factorization, which can be found by breaking up the components until you get all primes. 36 has more prime factors than 34, which means it can be broken down more times. In this sense, 36 is more composite and 34 is more prime. In fact, numbers with only two prime factors are called semi-primes. So counting the prime factors gives you a pretty good idea of how composite a number is. But just because a number has a lot of prime factors doesn't mean it has a lot of unique prime factors. For example, 30 has three prime factors which are all different, while 32 has five, but they're all twos. The discrepancy affects how many total factors a number has. Finding all the factors is easy if you have the prime factorization. You just have to change the exponents above the primes where each one ranges from 0 to whatever it is in the original number. Every combination gives you a unique factor, so to find the number of them, you just take the original exponents, add 1 to each of them, and multiply them together. With this process, we can see that 32 has 6 total factors and 30 has 8. As a function, the number of divisors of n is denoted d of n or sigma 0 of n, and its graph looks like this. Primes always score 2, and composite numbers score more than 2. One thing you'll notice is that the scores are almost always even. This is because factors usually come in pairs. If k is a factor of n, then so is n over k. The only way to have an unpaired factor is if there's a k where k equals n over k. In other words, n is k squared. So the only numbers that get an odd score are all the square numbers. Another thing you'll notice is that the scores tend to increase, and will never hit an absolute maximum. But if we look at which numbers have a higher score than anything before them, we get things like 36, 48, and 60, which are a good representation of very composite numbers. In fact, these ones are officially called highly composite numbers. But there's still something this score doesn't capture. Basically, it doesn't care what the factors actually are, only whether they're unique. In practice, we would usually place much more importance on being divisible by 2 rather than 3, whereas 79 and 53 are both pretty unimportant prime factors. So what's the best way to capture this? Well, instead of counting how many factors a number has, we take the sum of all the factors. Even though bigger factors obviously mean a bigger sum, the score actually places a lot of emphasis on smaller prime factors like 2. To explain why, we need to remember factors almost always come in pairs. The biggest possible factor other than n itself is n over 2, but this will only be a factor if 2 is also a factor. This function is called the sum of divisors function and is denoted sigma 1 of n, or just sigma of n. It's actually just a special case of the generalized function sigma k of n, where you raise each divisor to the power of k before adding them. Since any number to the 0 is 1, this explains why sigma 0 counts the factors. The sigma function is pretty important in number theory with connections to the famous Riemann zeta function. Now it seems like it would be tricky to calculate since it's defined by finding every single factor. But there's actually a trick that makes it a lot easier. Sigma of n is what's known as a multiplicative function. This means for two numbers a and b, if a and b are coprime, meaning they have no factors in common, then sigma of a times b equals sigma a times sigma b. 
This means we can always break it up into powers of different primes, since those are always coprime. The only factors of a power of a prime are powers of that same prime, in which case their sum can be calculated with a geometric series identity. The graph of sigma of n looks like this. Primes are always found along the n plus 1 line, and composites are always above it. On a local scale, it gives a good sense of how composite a number is, but on a larger scale, the sigma value is strongly impacted by the size of n, making comparisons harder. The easiest way to adjust for this is to realize that by far, the biggest contribution always comes from n itself. So what we can do is take the sum of all divisors except for n. These are called proper divisors, and their sum is called the aliquot sum. It's denoted s of n, and is equivalent to sigma of n minus n. When we graph it, we can see that the minimum value now remains constant, because primes always score exactly 1. Numbers with a relatively high aliquot sum are called abundant, while those with a low aliquot sum are deficient. The line y equals x is what divides numbers into the official categories of abundant and deficient, but a select few numbers are exactly equal to their aliquot sum, putting them right on the line. These ones are known as perfect numbers, and since they're composed of their proper divisors, they're literally equal to the sum of their parts. The first few are 6, 28, 496, and 8128, after which they become increasingly rare. There are 51 known perfect numbers, and they're all even. It remains unproven whether there are infinitely many perfect numbers, or whether there exist any odd perfect numbers. And it's not for lack of trying. Mathematicians have wondered these questions for thousands of years. This desire to strive for perfection has led to the discovery of many sets of almost perfect numbers, which will probably get their own video. But for now, we'll focus on how the quest for perfection affects how we use the aliquot sum. Given a number n and its aliquot sum s of n, you can see how far off from perfection it is by taking the difference between them. This is equivalent to sigma of n minus 2n, and is called the abundance of n. This value is positive for abundant numbers, negative for deficient numbers, and zero for perfect numbers. When we graph abundance, we can see that primes get more and more deficient as you go. But there are still plenty of abundant numbers. In fact, abundant numbers have asymptotic density of about 0.25, which means in the limiting case, about one-fourth of all numbers are abundant. So what are these abundant numbers? Well, if you look at abundant numbers up to 100, you'll immediately notice a pattern. Multiples of 6 are always abundant, and this is no coincidence. If n is a multiple of a perfect or abundant number, then n will automatically be abundant, and it's easy to prove this by looking at the factors that carry over. There are 21 abundant numbers under 100, and 16 of them are multiples of perfect numbers 6 or 28. The first one that isn't is 20. Its factors are all deficient, so it's what's known as a primitive abundant number. 40 and 80 are multiples of 20, so the next two primitive abundant numbers are 70 and 88. Primitive abundant numbers are often just barely above the positive threshold. But what numbers have the highest abundance? Well, the function doesn't have a maximum because you can always find a number with any arbitrarily large abundance. So what we can do instead is look at which numbers have higher abundance than anything before them. These are the ones that break the record of highest abundance so far. When we do this, we get very round numbers, including a lot of multiples of 12 and then of 60. In my opinion, it would make sense to call these ones highly abundant, but that term is technically defined a bit differently. Instead of having a higher abundance than all previous numbers, they only need to have a higher sigma of n compared to all previous numbers. Without the minus 2n, the function grows faster and it's easier to break the record, so we get a less refined superset of the previous ones. In fact, there are 7 numbers that are actually deficient, but still highly abundant. In my opinion, the abundance value is the better way to characterize abundant, deficient, and perfect numbers, and gives a lot of insight into the personalities of the numbers. But the sigma function is easier to use because it's multiplicative, and it's more relevant in number theory theorems. Meanwhile, the aliquot sum is the better representation of how composite numbers are, since primes get the same score. We can combine the advantages of all three of these by simply dividing by n, in which case the three versions differ only by constant amounts. If we choose sigma of n over n, then the function is once again multiplicative. This is called the relative abundance of n, also known as the abundancy index. An interesting property is that sigma of n over n is actually equal to sigma negative 1 of n, which is the sum of the reciprocals of the divisors. The graph looks like this. 
Numbers with a higher relative abundance than anything before them are called superabundant, and they form a subset of the highly abundant numbers. The sequence might look familiar because these ones are exactly the first few highly composite numbers. But even though each set of numbers is infinite, their overlap is finite, and there are only 449 numbers that are both. The divisor count and relative abundance are both of the form sigma k of n divided by n to the k. But even though they produce similar results in this regard, the relative abundance has features that make me vastly prefer it as a way to characterize the personalities of different numbers. First of all, there's a greater variety in scores because they don't have to be integers. Primes always score n plus 1 over n, which decreases as you go, but approaches 1 asymptotically, which I think makes a lot of sense. As for the max value, it does increase infinitely, but the growth rate is much slower than what we've seen before, so comparisons make more sense. Additionally, the line of perfect numbers is just relative abundance of exactly 2, with abundant numbers above and deficient ones below. Now there is an even more refined subset of the superabundant numbers called colossally abundant numbers. So far, we've always looked at the highest value so far because none of the functions had an absolute maximum. But sigma of n has a growth rate of n log log n. Dividing it by n, the max value still grows infinitely, but dividing by n to a power even slightly more than 1 means the function will have an absolute maximum. Depending on what this value is, different numbers are given a time to shine. So we say a number k is colossally abundant if there's a positive epsilon, where sigma of n divided by n to the 1 plus epsilon reaches its absolute maximum at k. With this definition, colossally abundant numbers are quite rare. Anyway, now that we've categorized the different types of abundant numbers, what can we do with them? Well, if you need a large number whose exact value is somewhat arbitrary, we usually tend to gravitate towards round numbers ending with zeros, because they're easy to work with. But if you instead choose a highly abundant number, then you can easily create subdivisions of it. The number 60 is actually both a round number and colossally abundant, making it very convenient to use. This is why the ancient Babylonians used base 10 as a sub-base within base 60, and this is why we still use 60 seconds in a minute and minutes in an hour. A similar thing applies for 24 hours in a day. 365 days in a year isn't arbitrary, but it is conveniently close to superabundant 360. So what the ancient Egyptians did was use a 360-day year, plus 5 extra days considered outside of the year. 360 is also the number of degrees in a circle, which gives integer measures for a lot of different fractions of it. Not every integer number of degrees is easy to work with, for example 147, but what we can do is understand that number in terms of ones that are easy to work with. 147 is just 120 plus 18 plus 9, which means 147 degrees is one-third of a circle plus one-twentieth plus one-fortieth. In fact, you can pick any number from 1 to 360, and it's always possible to express it as the sum of different proper divisors of 360. This feature has a special name. A practical number is one where any number from 1 to n can be expressed as the sum of a subset of the proper divisors of n. Actually, the definition only requires 1 to n minus 1, but other than powers of 2, practical numbers satisfy this condition anyway. It's actually possible to tell if a number is practical just from its prime factorization. If the prime factors are in order, then each new prime must be less than or equal to the sigma of everything before it. Practical numbers might seem like a pretty random thing to care about, but there are actually lots of interesting ways in which they're analogous to primes. The density of prime numbers decreases as you go, and the number of primes less than n is about n over natural log of n. Practical numbers are a bit more common, but they have the same asymptotic distribution. The distribution of prime numbers is one of the biggest mysteries in all of math, and it relates to the most famous unsolved problems. It's conjectured that every even number is the sum of two primes, also that there are infinitely many primes spaced two apart, and that consecutive perfect squares always contain a prime in between them. All three of these remain unproven, but their equivalents with the prime-like practical numbers are proven. Anyway, if you look at the relative abundance graph, being abundant and being practical are highly correlated. Being abundant isn't a strict requirement, though. Powers of 2 and even perfect numbers are always practical. Other than those, all practical numbers are abundant, but not all abundant numbers are practical. You often get non-practical numbers just above the abundance threshold. 
but even if you can't make every number up to n, you can usually make the most important one of these, which is n itself. This property also has a special name. A semi-perfect number, also called pseudo-perfect, is one where there's a subset of the proper divisors of n that adds up to exactly n. Deficient numbers can't be semi-perfect, and perfect numbers are automatically semi-perfect, so the term mainly applies to abundant numbers. As it turns out, abundant numbers are almost always semi-perfect. The rare exceptions are 70, 836, 4030, and so on. This is the one and only sequence of weird numbers. After the first few, they actually get a bit more common and even have positive asymptotic density. This is because if n is a weird number, then you can multiply it by any prime number greater than sigma of n to get another weird number, which is why we get lots of multiples of 70. So just like we did with abundant numbers, we can say a primitive weird number is one that isn't divisible by any smaller weird numbers. With this, we can see just how weird 70 is. Despite having an aliquot sum so close to perfection, 70 is not semi-perfect, which in a way makes it further from perfection than the other abundant numbers. It is a primitive abundant number, which is already pretty rare, but even among those, most of them are semi-perfect rather than weird. It's also interesting to get a weird number so early on. 70 is less than 100, but one of only three weird numbers less than 5,000. Prime factorization and relative abundance are some of the best ways to know a number's personality, and 70 is just so unique in those regards. You might not care about this very much, which is reasonable, but in my opinion, knowing the personalities of the numbers you use on a daily basis gives a whole new outlook on them, which should not be taken for granted. Anyway, if you learned something interesting, make sure to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!